Hi, welcome to Superhero Rundown. I'm Jess, and today we're talking about the male gaze. Hey, do I, like, get a break in the next video? No? More ridiculousness? Okay. Now look, before I begin with this, we're using Catwoman because A, Halle Berry tried really hard with that script she was given, and B, Sharon Stone is just a boss. In Why I've Changed My Mind About Halle Berry's Catwoman, the author explains, the script shouldn't have called for weird cat powers, but it did and Barry showed up, making her performance in Catwoman campy and dare I say lovable. The lines are putrid, but learning to appreciate Barry's commitment to selling them is what made them so endearing. The corny one-liners only increase as Patience gets more comfortable with her newfound abilities, and to put it frankly, they belong right next to the ones delivered by Arnold Schwarzenegger's Mr. Freeze and Batman and Robin. So you're saying to yourself, Jess, we know about that, but why aren't we talking about the sexy stuff or male gaze? You know, the shit that'll get you flagged on YouTube. You'd be right, but that doesn't mean we can't talk about the reception of Catwoman first. The reason reception is so important is because you don't really talk about the male gaze in good films like Atomic Blonde or Magic Mike, though Magic Mike is a case we will be looking at briefly in this video. Now, reception of Catwoman was pretty bad. It was a box office and critical flop on all counts, and if I'm to be frank, I think it's part of the reason we haven't had as many female-led action films, though that has improved in recent times. Think about it. Catwoman is so bad that its judgment is so terrible that it chooses to create an entirely new alter ego origin story for the character. Rather than Selina Kyle, the woman who has been Catwoman from the beginning, the movie follows Patience Phillips, played by Halle Berry, a meek, frustrated artist whose life changes after she discovers a dark conspiracy in the cosmetics company that employs her, as quoted in How Not to Talk to Women, The Catwoman Disaster. Yeah, they didn't even do Selina Kyle. They went with a completely new character. Yeesh. But before we get to the movie itself, let's talk about what has happened since. In the same article, it's mentioned that Barry even showed up in person to accept the Razzie she won for her work, where she thanked the people responsible for putting her in a piece of shit god-awful movie. She was a good sport, bless her, but things didn't improve immediately, what with flops like 2003's Charlie's Angels Full Throttle and 2005's Electra, among others. And I guess that female-led action movies are a thing now? There's The Hunger Games, Spy, The New Star Wars Trilogy, Atomic Blonde, Captain Marvel, Wonder Woman. Oh. Die mad about it, nerds. But like I mentioned in the top five good things to happen to superheroes in 2019, we still got a long way to go, and the article outlines what exactly that entails. However, women of color still lag behind in action film representation, with 2018's Proud Mary and this year's Fast Color being among the few where black women have been front and center. There are signs of change, with Chloe Zhao set to direct The Eternals, a new Marvel superhero film with a diverse cast, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie soon to be the first openly LGBTQA plus MCU superhero, and even an upcoming biopic of Harriet Tubman. It's relatively small growth, but hopefully it points to a time where action films with black female leads won't continue to be so few and far between. With that in mind, let's talk about why Catwoman isn't exactly a good role model. So we start out with the cat goddess Bast, which is actually accurate, even if most of the other parts of the movie are not. And we also discover that Bowline is a beauty product that is found to disintegrate your your face. Okay, right off the bat, they're portraying this weird thing that beauty products are bad for you, which don't get me wrong, some of them are. But if you're gonna do that, at least explain what's in it. They like never really tell us. So Patience is a mousy lady in an office who wears non-sexy clothes until her awakening, and when the cats gather, we can safely assume she has actually died. After that, it's leather, red lipstick, and eyeliner. She steals a bike and at least stays true to her Selena counterpart by robbing jewelry stores. Then we get the sexy outfit, bandeau with hot leather pants, long gloves, and a cat mask. It's a bad outfit for Catwoman. It probably chafes, it definitely is not a stealthy outfit with leather crunching about, and it probably is a bitch to clean. If nothing else, I'm practical. The problem with this movie in particular seems to have the thesis that mousy women who start wearing sexy clothes equals character growth. It really doesn't, though. If anything, it just makes the male gaze angle all the more apparent. 
The article mentioned earlier, How to Not Talk to Women, the Catwoman Disaster, sums up what the movie actually is telling us. Powers tells patients that she's part of a long line of Catwomen who have existed throughout history and that she will know a freedom other women never will. That freedom basically entails confidence independence, and choosing to follow her own desires, which is apparently so unimaginable to the male filmmakers that a woman would need actual superpowers to accomplish any of this. Let's start with the concept of the male gaze, then we'll explain female gaze, which, spoilers, isn't a thing, and the magic mic defense. Then finally, we'll use a classic example of cinema to explain the concept of male gaze. According to Explainer, what does the male gaze mean and what about a female gaze? We define the male gaze as thus. The male gaze invokes the sexual politics of the gaze and suggests a sexualized way of looking that empowers men and objectifies women. In the male gaze, woman is visually positioned as an object of heterosexual male desire. Her feelings, thoughts, and her own sexual drives are less important than her being framed by male desire. It's always about guys. Look, it's fine for women to present themselves as sexy on their own, for themselves. The fact that filmmakers present female characters as what they think males think sexy is, is... What's the word I'm looking for? Gross. The word is gross. Okay, but have we gotten better? Not really. The same article points out, filmmakers often attempt to avoid presenting female characters as mere sexual objects by giving them complex backstories, strong motivations, and an active role in the plot of their story. Yet the masculine gaze is still commonplace. But what about female gaze? Certainly beautiful men abound in cinema, but I'd argue that there is no direct female equivalent of the male gaze. The male gaze creates a power in balance. It supports a patriarchal status quo, perpetuating women's real-life sexual objectification. For this reason, the female gaze cannot be like the male gaze, says Janice Lorek, who wrote the article. Okay, so what about Magic Mike? Well, Magic Mike is especially different because the men on screen are in charge of their sexuality. It's not like they're going out of their way and saying, We have our ways, hmm? but they are flaunting their maleness for the viewer. Why isn't this female gaze? Because like Lorik says, the male gaze creates a power imbalance and Magic Mike doesn't experience that power imbalance. If anything, the men are further empowered by their maleness to keep stripping. In Visual Drive and Cinematic Narrative by Clifford T. Manlove, that's... That's a name, all right. He explains gaze theory like this. Gaze theory has also made its way into literary and cultural studies, queer theory, post-colonial studies, Holocaust studies, black slash whiteness studies, and critical race theory. In most cases, the gaze is used to help explain the hierarchical power relations between two or more groups, or alternatively, between a group and an object. Researchers variously point to the following, white and black gazes, the tourist gaze, heterosexual and homosexual gazes, the imperial gaze, the transatlantic gaze, the animal gaze, and the metafictional gaze, to name but a few. Mostly gazes are usually held by people in power with few exceptions, very few exceptions. So with that in mind, I wanted to examine a film that Manlove brings up in his article, Vertigo by Alfred Hitchcock. I still can't believe this guy's name is Manlove. I mean, this is like the worst name you could have when you're writing about male gaze. Vertigo does differentiate between the eye and the eye's gaze. It's about the period of time following a near-death experience in the main character Scotty's life. He nearly falls from the top of a multi-story building and develops vertigo. Manlove explains, Rather than being a mild fear of heights, however, vertigo induces a physically nauseating sense of teetering on the edge of a vast whirlpool, such as the one depicted in a woman's eye in the opening credits of the film. Scotty is trapped in this visual trauma, split from the symbolic and imaginary reality of the rational world around him. He further explains, In Scotty's case, the film suggests that the traumatic encounter occurs at the end of the opening scene. All subsequent conflict in the film radiates from this point. The gaze appears with Scotty's accidental slip on a sloping rooftop while chasing a suspect. Scotty's slip occurs after he and a uniformed police officer follow a male criminal suspect across a rooftop while jumping a cavernous alley. Hanging from the gutter of a multi-story building, Scotty cannot help but stare into the 
alley far below, an unforgettable encounter with the real. The viewer shares Scotty's look in an eyeline match, including one of Hitchcock's cinematographic innovations, the vertigo shot, created by simultaneously tracking the camera backwards while also zooming the camera lens in, an effect that is repeated in several scenes to mark the presence of the gaze. What to a rational observer looks like an alleyway, Scotty sees as a threatening object, simultaneously approaching yet infinitely receding. And while there is male gaze in the film, the vertigo shots have nothing inherently male gaze about them. It's about Scotty's point of view. It's the difference between the eye and the gaze. According to Salvo Zizak, the eye viewing the object is on the side of the subject, while the gaze is on the side of the object. When I look at an object, the object is already gazing at me and at a point from which I cannot see it. Surrounded by the vertiginous reel, Scotty's eyes, used to maintaining public order, are inflicting great anxiety on him. When his fellow policeman falls while trying to save him, it must seem to Scotty not only as if his partner has sacrificed himself, but also that he is responsible. Now this is not male gaze. The vertigo example is to illustrate that there is a difference between what an eye of a character sees versus what a gaze of a character sees. Seeing her jump, it's not suicide Scotty cannot bear to see. Rather, it is his own failure to reach out to someone for whom he feels responsible. There is no active slash passive split between Scotty and Judy, even at the scopic level. Although Scotty believes that he is actively saving the apparently passive Judy. Scotty and Judy each think mistakenly that they see and know each other because each feels in possession of privileged information about the other. Scotty does not see that Judy knows she will be saved. Instead, he sees a woman, the wife of a friend, committing suicide. This is his fantasy, man love continues. The performance of narrative discourses can help the subject to disassociate the function of God or sovereignty from those objects the subject desires. The final shot of the film shows Scotty, arms at his side, standing in the bell tower over the dead form of his fantasy lying on the tiled roof below. His vertigo cured. Again, the body stares accusingly up at him, a stain on the love that was and should have been. Vertigo not only demonstrates the split between the gaze and the eye, but that the gaze has effects on the material world. It can kill. Vertigo is brilliant in a lot of ways. Unfortunately for us, Catwoman is not that brilliant. Mulvey's psychoanalytical conception of the male gaze has been widely adopted by theory and criticism across a variety of cultural and humanistic fields. Her thesis, that the pleasure found in one person gazing at another can be used for power, has the potential for broad application despite the steady criticism and revision by many of her colleagues in feminist and film studies. While pragmatic and cognitive approaches to film and culture may claim to be on the ascendancy since the mid-1990s, Mulvey's theory of the gaze has maintained its force precisely because it analyzes an aspect of vision that cannot necessarily be measured, counted, or even seen. I should explain that Laura Mulvey is the person who wrote Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, an essay in 1973. Noel Carroll wrote about Mulvey in his article, The Image of Women in Film, A Defense of a Paradigm. Work of this sort called to our attention the ways the imagery of women in our culture reoccurringly portrayed them through a limited, constraining, and ultimately oppressive repertory of characterizations. For example, in film, it was noted that very often the options for depicting were strongly structured by the dichotomy of the mother versus the whore. Carroll also states, the uncontroversial premise of Mulvey's essay is that the Hollywood cinema's success involves, undoubtedly among other things, the manipulation of the audience's visual pleasure. Moreover, Mulvey hypothesizes that the visual pleasure found in movies reflects patterns of visual fascination in the culture at large, a culture that is patriarchal. And she argues that it is important for feminists to identify those patterns of visual fascination, particularly in order to challenge them. And finally, for Mulvey, the female form in Hollywood film becomes a passive spectacle whose function is, first and foremost, to be seen. Here, the relevant perceiving subject may be identified as the male viewer and or the male character, who, through devices like point of view editing, serves as the delegate in the fiction for the male audience member, who might be said to identify with the male character in point of view editing. This idea may be stated in terms of saying that in Hollywood film, women are the object of the look or the gaze. Where does that leave Catwoman, you ask? The film is definitely in the vein of the male gaze, and I suppose it tells you to investigate your beauty products because it will disintegrate your face. I'm used to doing all kinds of things I don't want to do. I feel that, Sharon Stone. I feel that.
You know, we're not for children, right? Ice cream fuck on the internet about superheroes.